what was the purpose of Christ? The whole purpose, he says right here, at this part in his ministry, the purpose of Christ was preaching in Galilee, in all of Galilee, right? And that's what he says at this moment where we're at in Mark chapter 1, verse 35 and 39. We'll see that's what he says. That's his exact words in, in 38. And so there's a reason why he was out preaching the kingdom. There was a reason. And, and he knows so much more than we know. So as you turn to Mark chapter 1, verse 35 through 39, that's what we're going to go through today. And if when y'all are ready, I'll go ahead and, uh, and read it. It says, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place. And there he prayed. And Simon and those who were, were with him searched for him, and they found him. And they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. But he said to them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. And he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. Just a few little verses there. You know, when we look at verse 35, when we look at now in the morning, there's so much we can learn from, from what he's saying. But he says, now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there he prayed. So I want you to imagine. I want you to you know, go to your mind's eye and imagine Jesus in Capernaum. Jesus' house, or I mean at Peter's house, sorry. With the other disciples, there's been a long day they had earlier. You know, he had already been preaching there at the synagogue the day before, you know, or that, or, or actually, yeah, the day before. And he had cast out a demon at that synagogue. Next, he went, and they went on to Peter's house, which would have been like, as I showed you in the, in the pictures the, uh, last week or a couple weeks ago, it would have just been around the corner. They wouldn't have had to walk very far. Uh, he went to Peter's house and saw his mother-in-law right there, and she was ill. She was sick. She had a fever. And he just took her by the hand and he told her to get up. And she immediately did. And so those two things that happened right there, the, the demon cast out in the synagogue, and I'm assuming that the fever that happened where, where she just immediately got better, you know, that became famous around in that area. All of a sudden, his, you know, his fame spread. And when evening come, the Bible says that uh, going back to verse 32 and 34, it says they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. Now, I want to stop just in, in, in saying something right here in that part that I may have not shared a couple of weeks ago. Not every disease, not everything is because of demon possession or something. God clearly shows that there was two different parts right there. So it's just something to, to think about. Just nothing really, you know, majorly important just wanted to let you know that when people have sicknesses it's not always because now now the devil he can if you read job he can cause sicknesses and boils and things to happen to people he can even cause death 
you know, to people. We see that. His, Job lost his whole family in a whirlwind, a tornado or some sort of hurricane or however that was. His whole family was lost due to the devil, what the devil was allowed to do. Something here to ponder. You know, in verse 23 earlier, when we were talking last week about he cast out the demon, did you get that there was no sense of repentance from that man? You know, or faith, or even that that man wanted that demon taken away. You know, Jesus just told that demon to be quiet and come out of him and cast him out. So when you think about that, there's, it's not about how much faith the person has. And so it's something to think about as you ponder this through, I, I believe that I'm going to show you why, and this is the reason why, at the end, when we, when we get closer to the end, about why he was out casting out demons and preaching in the synagogues. You know, but this is, again, the reason why Jesus came. You know, we see that in verse 38. He says that. So what a long day it would have been now. He found it, you know, most important to get up that morning and pray to his father. You know, he did this before daylight, and he also did it with nobody else knowing. Obviously, he left, and nobody knew that he did what he did. You, nobody knew that he had got up. They says those that were with him went out searching, seeking him. You know, and that brings up what the Lord often tells us is to pray secretly. You know, many people become impressed with long prayers and fancy words and people that pray in public. You know, when I stand up here in front of this pulpit and I pray just like a few minutes ago, it's one of the hardest things for me to do. And it's not one of my favorite things to do in public because my heart, I have to be weary of my heart, of what I say amongst people, amongst everybody, because I don't want to hurt people's feelings. I don't want to say something out of the... I'm always worried about what I'm going to say. You know, and... I want to do things, but then I, you know, it's just, it's a hard thing. And for anybody who prays in public, you know, even when I ask you guys to pray, I'm sure it's hard for you guys to pray, you know, uh, and tough because you know that, that, that sense. But now one of the things Jesus tells us, he sets an example of how we should pray is not always in public. You know, we most of the time, he tells us to pray in secret. You know, and he gives us this lesson. Jesus, you know, right here is setting an example. It says, when he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. You know, he's setting an example of how our prayer life should be. Going on to talk about the examples, the words he said exactly, when you look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 and 6, he sits there and he says, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in secret place. 
And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And that's one of the things. You know, Jesus warns us about praying for being seen by others. You know, a lot of times when, when I go to work, a lot of times those thoughts come on my mind because when I pray over my food, sometimes I won't even let the person know that I'm praying. And I'm sure it, it makes them wonder, why is this person not praying before they eat, you know, at work in a public place? But this is one of the reasons. And I just don't want people to think that that prayer, I'm doing it for show. Sometimes I'll close my eyes and look, but I don't want to be doing it because people are looking at me or seeing. And I'm afraid that sometimes that is how it, how it is. So, you know, and, and, you know, instead he teaches us here to pray in private. We're, we're our communion with the Father, where we're in communion with him, where we talk to him. You know, we take this communion in remembrance of him. But, you know, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the just communicating with our Father in heaven. You know, and that's solely what we should do. You know, verse 7 on right there, Matthew chapter 6, verse 7, it says, And when you pray, don't use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they'll be heard with their many words. You know, that immediately thinks to me of people that say so many Hail Marys and pray, you know, they do this. Or they go somewhere and pray a certain amount of times a day. You know, or even others that go out, you know, I think about the pictures, the, the, the videos. I've never been to Israel. I've never been to the Welling Wall, but you'll see people up there and they'll pray, go there all day and they'll pray. And you'll see them just shaking their head and praying all day, asking for something. You know, Jesus says, don't do this in repetition. And many times as I pray, as I, I realize that even when I, I, I pray with, for my lunch and for my breakfast or, or for my food, a lot of times I'll use the same things. And it makes me wonder, Lord, I don't want to, to do that either in repetition. You know, and so God right here, Jesus is, is cautioning us about using basically long-winded prayers or, or, or emphasize, you know, he, he emphasizes your relationship with him more than just any words that you could say. And so those are, are that sincerity that you bring along. That's what he desires, that heart of how you feel. You know, another thing we should think about here, that he says, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place. You know, and, and I need to start this as a daily task. Even this morning, I wanted, I set my alarm clock a little bit earlier, and I hit the snooze button. 20 times probably. You know, so I'm preaching to myself more than to anybody else. You know, because I'm as guilty. But we need to think about the context of what he is saying here. Even after a long day he had just had earlier, he still finds time to get up early in the morning and commune with his father before daylight. He makes that a priority. And he makes it a priority that he goes to a secret place, to a solitary place, right? And he prayed. And so I often think how successful we as Christians, as believers would be, 
if we did that. I know myself, I don't get up early and go off, go outside or go somewhere to a, a special place and pray. Although sometimes I'll talk to the Lord when I go to work and I'm driving in my car and that's sort of a place. But, but am I really dedicating my time? Am I really taking my time just like as you would love for your family members or somebody to come and visit you and take the time to solely to come see you. Are you solely going out to the Father just to spend time to commune with Him like Jesus wants us to? You know, David in Psalms chapter 5 verses 1 through 3 says, Give ear to my words, O Lord, and consider my meditation. Give heed to the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For to you I will pray, my voice you shall hear in the morning. O Lord, in the morning I will direct it to you, and I will look up. I will look up. Also in Psalm 63, and there's other verses just not here. But Psalm 63, 1 says, you, it says, Oh God, you are my God. Early I will seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. In a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. You know, I wonder sometimes, are we in that dry and thirsty land? Are we not having the water, the living water, that we desire because we're not early in the morning seeking Him. You know, our, our Lord's given us an example of what we should be like, what we should do to get up early in the morning. You know, David right here, his Psalms reflect the discipline that he took. Seeking God early in the morning in prayer. And how much that say should be a priority in our life. You know, I again I I need to myself. I'm preaching to me. But I'm the one that needs to do that. How much more successful? Look how, you know, I often think of how successful David was. In his, even though he had messed up several times, he was able to kill lions and bears with his bare hands, and he slew a giant. And all that was because he trusted the Lord. And that was his trust. That was his, he was mighty in the Lord because. I would say early in the morning he found that discipline to go seek. You know, I, I think of myself, am I letting you guys down because I'm not out there? And that could be the same with each and every one of you. Are you letting other people down because you're not out there praying to the Lord for your strength throughout the days. You know, again, I preach to myself because that's how I feel. As I read this, as I see it, as, as the Lord convicts me. You know, one last thing to think about when Jesus prayed. <laughs> he didn't have to start His prayer like us. Each and every one of us, because we are sinful people, we go to and the very first thing we say is, Lord, forgive us. I know I do. The very first thing I think is, Lord, I know I've probably hurt somebody's feelings. I've probably stepped on some toes. I've probably had thoughts that I shouldn't have had. And even in ways that I, I don't even realize when I... I'm not there for everybody that I should be there for. The Lord says, you know, you should even be there for this person or that person. And I don't. 
You know, I have to go to him and say, Lord, forgive me. You know, he wasn't like that. He didn't have to go in and say the first thing because he was sinless. He didn't have to say, Lord, forgive me. You know, so it makes me think, what was, what was, his, what was his prayers like? What did he pray like when he went and prayed? You know, he, he went straight to communion. And what he, you know, as I was looking and looking for what his prayers was, one of them, you know, you know, first Peter, you just, well, let's just say this before I go there. To say that he was sinless, to show that he, where he was sinless and he didn't need that. First, P, uh, first Peter chapter two, verses 21 and 22 says, for this you were called because Christ also suffered for us. Leaving us an example. See, like I said, everything that Christ done is leaving us an example. But that you should follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was there deceit found in his mouth. So you see, he did, he left us these examples. Not only for us to stop sinning, or for deceit to be found in our mouth, he, he, he left us that example. Another thing, 1 John chapter 3, 5 says, And you know that he was manifest to take away our sins, and in him there was no sin. And Jesus himself, if you look at this verse, John chapter 8, verse 45 and 46, Jesus himself says, Because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Then he says to those Pharisees and Sadducees, which of you convicts me of sin? Asking the question, basically, you know, where's my sin at? He himself is showing that he was sinless. It come out of his mouth that I have committed. Where do you convict me of sin? You know, and he goes on and says, if I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? So the Bible, there's other Bible verses, though, that we see Jesus' prayers would have been for intercession of others, right? Thanksgiving. His submission to the will of the Father. Humility, trust, and obedience. You know, I got a list of verses right here. You know, you can see it in Matthew 26, 39, Luke 22, 43, and 44, John 11, 41, John chapter 17, Matthew chapter 11, 25, and 26, Luke 23 and through 34, and Luke 23, 46. You know, these were all prayers. These were all places if you, you know... If I went through fast, it's, it's going to be on the channel later on. If you want to look at those, those were his prayers. And those were many times, like I said, where he went and prayed for us. You know, not only did he pray for his disciples, he prayed for the, even those, us, at that time. You know, or you remember, not as thy will, but as your will, O Lord, O Father. You know, he prayed for that trust and that obedience. And so when we go, those are other examples. If we don't know what we should go to the Father and pray about, take Scripture with you. Ask the Lord about this Scripture. You know, when you go before Him, talk to Him and ask Him about these things. Say, Lord, it... Help me to understand this. Help me to see this. Help me to know that. You know, pray for those that are around us. You know, intercede for those. Give thanksgiving. Learn how to be obedient. It's what he wants. You know, Hebrews chapter 5 verse 5 through 11. I wanted to read this to you because it talks about his prayers. 
It says, So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but was he who, was, who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. And as he also says in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Who in the days, right here, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to, to save him from death, he was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things to which all who obey him, by which he suffered, I'm sorry. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Called by God, as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain, since you have become in dull of hearing. So the author of Hebrews sits there and says, as he was talking to the people, he was telling them basically how Jesus had prayed and how he had went to you know, with tears. And as he tries to explain this, it's hard to for people to understand because they become dull of hearing what it was. And that run, one thing right there that we see at the very end, don't become dull of hearing God's Word. His Word is perfect. And saving the soul. Now let's go on to Mark, the next. That, that's a lot in just one verse. And when we look at verse 36, we see Simon and those who were with him searching for him. Again, that shows that he did not intend for others to know what he was doing. He went privately. You know, and it shows he set that example for us not to let other people know when we go to pray what we're doing. You know, verse 37 says, and when they found him, they said to him, everyone was looking for you. You know, when you, you know, as I was looking And I didn't really bring it up, but that where everybody is looking for you when they were seeking, when, when Peter came up and he said, or, or it, you know, whoever said that to him, probably Peter. It was kind of like agitated, like, hey, everybody's looking for you. Where have you been in a way, you know? And so just sit here and think about this. Here, the, here we see the next day. After he healed the entire city, we just learned, his fame had gone out, you know, to everyone. And everybody had come back that morning, you know, looking for him. Maybe, maybe to see another miracle. I'm sure it would have been a real exciting time. I mean, you know, I don't know what first century Israel looked like that great i wasn't there but i'm sure that they weren't just so distracted with all the other things that we are distracted on they would have seen somebody that would have been already hey this, this guy cast out a demon and and and, and he healed this woman and, and now he's done healed the entire city the whole city came to him that whole night could you imagine? I want you to just sit here and imagine how that took place. You know, stories of the blind seeing, the lame walking, demon possessed, being set free would have been on everybody's lips. They'd have been just sitting there, just, did you see that? Did you, did you hear about that? 
You know, the news would have spread all about Jesus. The more people would have gathered at Peter's house that morning. They'd have been right there just eager to catch a glimpse of Jesus. Let's see what he's going to do next. You know, the crowd would have been asking that with wonder. What's he, what's he about to do? Who's next? You know, and what's funny, however, verse 38 tells us, but he said to them, let us go into the next town that I may preach there also, for because for this purpose I have come forth. Ain't that a weird way of thinking? I mean, could you imagine what, what Peter would have been thinking in his head? You got a whole bunch of people at my house and you're ready to go somewhere else. You know, instead of returning to the crowd, Jesus had ridden, risen up early to pray Spending time in communion with the Father. When the disciples found him, they mentioned that everybody was looking for him. And Jesus didn't just rush back to perform more miracles. Because it wasn't about the fame. You know, I believe, again, me preaching to myself, I myself if this parking lot was full and, and, and we had to build a bigger church, and I could imagine what my mind, I'd be fearful that my mind would be. I'd feel like I was somebody different. You know, I'd feel like I was important or special or something. I think I would fail right here. At this point, I'd be like, yeah, let's go and look at all these people, I, I, you know, I'm being able to minister to or whatever. You know, can you imagine the temptation for popularity right there that Jesus would have, it would have been heavily on him, that temptation that he would have had. You know, in reading commentaries and stuff, uh, Kenneth S. Worst, worst. It, it's called the worst word study in the Greek New Testament, which is the one day I'd like to learn how to read Greek and know exactly how it goes. But anyways, looking in those things, one of the things, the real reason, he says, the real reason for the flight was doubtless a desire to preach, was doubtlessly a desire to preach in as many synagogues as possible before the hostility of the scribes. You know, he says, instinctively dreaded, which, you know, I had, I had to look up these words, instinctively dread, dreaded, had time to act obstructively. Jesus had planned, uh, had a plan of preaching tour through Galilee and he felt that he could not begin too soon. So looking up those and trying to explain what he said, he dreaded knowing that the cross was coming. He instinctively would have dreaded that. He knew that that harshness and that hard times was going to come. You know, and that he had just a certain amount of time to act upon it before... The, you know, when it says obstructively, the, 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 the religious leaders, the people would have come up with a plan to stop him from going to different places. It's not that he didn't want to heal all these people. It's that he had a certain amount of time he had to do things in. He had a mission that he had to set forth. You know, and, and he had to go throughout all of the synagogues. Not just the one there in Capernaum. You know, he says this because, because of this purpose I have come forth. You know, this part right here. You see, when he said this, if he would have stayed there in Capernaum, yes, he would have had a following. 
But it would have only been just a few. He indeed, though, was after the entire world. Think of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The world, right there. That whosoever would believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And here we are, 2,000 years later, sitting here, listening to God's Word, listening to His footsteps, listening to His, what He did, what was most important. You see, His knowledge is so much more than, you know, when the Bible says that, you know, His ways are so much higher than our ways, and His thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts. He's so much smarter than we could ever be. And could you imagine going out every morning in communion with Him? How much we, we lose by not doing that. Yeah, I'm sure Peter would have wondered like, why are we leaving now? You've got all these people here. But you know, as, he, as I was writing that, the very first thing that come to my mind there in Capernaum is, what did, he, what did he say? You know, I remember what he said later on about Capernaum. Do you remember what he said? You know, Matthew chapter 11, 23 and 24 says, And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. You see, Jesus knew they were really there for a show. But he was to talk about the kingdom, to spread the news, the good news of the kingdom of God. His main focus was spreading that message. Not merely just performing a few miracles. You see that he says, you know, when we look at verse 39, it says, and he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all of Galilee and casting out demons. See, it says he went throughout all of Galilee preaching and casting out demons. That's what it says. And so, like I brought up earlier, what do you think when it says that uh, they added demons here? You know, why did... Why did he add demons? Why didn't it say, you know, he's went out preaching and healing the sick and doing this? Why do you think he brought up demons here? And why do you think he cast out demons even without them asking, hey, you know, help me out. I, I need to get rid of this demon. You know, many people get demons. They, If you look at the world today and you look at what some of the people do, they want those demons. They want them because they think they could get some kind of extra knowledge or something to help them in life some which way or better. We all know that. Just look at what we hear about Hollywood and people giving up selling their soul to the devil so they could get riches and fame and glory. When we saw, you know, a couple weeks ago, we saw Paul, this woman was following them around and the demon was sitting there saying, hey, I know you guys, y'all are the, you, from, from, from Jesus, the Holy One. Y'all are His servants. And it annoyed Paul so much that he sat there and he cast her out. And guess what? Those people weren't happy that she was gone. They, 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 they were mad because they lost their money. You know, could it be the reason why he went around casting out demons was because he wanted people to know an accurate word. See, he was going to their synagogues and casting out demons. Could it be that they wanted the accurate word of God? 
And demons, what are they known for? False doctrines, doctrines of devils, demons. You know, 1 Timothy, the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1 said, refers to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Demons are not just malevolent, you know, worried about, you know, what they can do to hurt you. They're about spreading lies and falsehoods, leading people away from the truth of God. By casting them out, Jesus was directly confronting and removing the spiritual deception for the people to see exactly God's truth. And those, they were, the demons were opposing God's truth. They were in there spreading their lies and their false doctrines. They're self-righteous and, and they had to become, you know, a workspace, like had to do things to, we got to be just this way or we're not, not going to make it, not going to see God. You know, and that reminded me of, even more what the Bible says. Galatians chapter 1, verse 8 says, But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. You know, I got a list of angels right here. Supposed this is their names. Ain't, devils lie all the time, so you can't trust anything they say. But... The angel Gabriel, he sit there, or Jabbar, he's the one that came to Muhammad, told them something totally different than what Paul is teaching, told them something totally different than what Christ is teaching. The angel Menorah went to Joseph Smith, started the Mormons. He got the golden tablets, telling them something different, totally different. From what is teach, but yet they say, "Oh, but we use the the word." Obviously, the Michael Arch Michael the Archangel. If you ask any Jehovah Witness, they'll say that's who Jesus is, the Michael Archangel. So why would they say that if they didn't sit there and have it led to them some which way, and including, like he said, but if. Even if we, meaning man, can spread false lies about God's Word. How about New Age? A lot of New Age beliefs that are out there. And I'm sure if you watch TikTok any at all, you've heard about all the Gnostic Gospels, the Gnostic, the, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the Gospel of all these things. You know, most of them all said they were brought by some kind of angelic being. They claim it in their text. That some kind of angel brought them that text. So, looking back at this, what does, the, what does this teach us about our response to Jesus' work in our lives. Are we truly seeking Him? Or are we just looking at whatever signs or whatever feeling we have inside or whatever we may think, you know? You know, another question I asked was, could we be those who pray over our meals or just pray at night as we go to bed, just that little prayer, and think that we're all good. And we're all prayed up and good to go. I said my prayer. Or do we primarily focus on the communion with the Father and Jesus? Are we, are we focusing on, on Him? And lastly... Could we be here today learning God's Word 
and listening to it. And like Capernaum, with everything they saw, with Jesus right there in their midst. Be hearers only and not doers of the word, deceiving ourselves. You know, these are things that I wanted to leave you with to think, to ponder on this week. To ponder on not only this week, but to ponder in forever. Because we just read where Capernaum, you know, woe unto you. Yet they had Jesus right there. That was his headquarters right there. They had Peter's house right there. Peter would have been the disciples. That would have been where they would have. That we even see that there was they built a church on top. If you look in history, they built a church on top of Peter's house. They met, if you look into that. So James chapter 1, verse 21 through 27. I wanted to read that for it. It says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. It says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing himself his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets about what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone thinks... He is religious, but does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart. This one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their time of trouble and to keep one's self unspotted from the world. So I ask you, reflect inside. Are you living out these truths that you've learned? Or are you at the risk of being like Capernaum? Seeing and hearing, but being unchanged. Back to John 3.16. I wanted to leave it with this. John 3.16 through 18. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world that he to condemn the world, but that through him he might be saved he who believes in him is not condemned but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God so if you're listening to this word and you don't believe you don't trust in him are you going to be like Capernaum if you trust in him and you believe then that's what he came for that was his whole purpose back to the very beginning What did I say? His purpose of Christ, the preaching in all of Galilee. So he went around preaching and teaching that we may have his word so that we may trust and have everlasting life. Let's pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we love you today and we just come to you. And Lord, we ask you to have this word sink into us. We ask you to, if there's anybody out there that doesn't know you, Father, that, that they may come to you, that they may believe and not be condemned like Capernaum who saw all the things, who had everybody healed, all the demons cast out, yet they still didn't believe. Lord, we have your word, your sure word. You know, we stand on your firm foundation that you've given us. Lord, we just love you and praise you, and we thank you for your word. And Lord, we do believe and we do trust. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So I got a song that I want to uh, play for you. And just if that's, if it leads you in to go and trust in him, that's what his altars are for. That's what sitting here, sit this church, hearing God's word, that's what it's for. So, let's sit there.